My name is Roma and this is Zim Love, a podcast about a feeling that I try to describe through the stories and anecdotes and perspective of others, wonderful people that I've met. And through their stories, I want to change the thoughts and the feelings that people have when they think about this beautiful place. Because once you put it into Google, all that pops up is expensive safaris or hyperinflation or even different stories. But there's a specific feeling to this place. And I want to show you through the eyes of others that after all everyone has been through and is going through, there is still a feeling that is true Zim love. So I've lived 26 years in Zimbabwe. I never in my life thought I would end up in Zimbabwe. In fact, when I first heard about Zimbabwe, I didn't even know where it was. So this was a place I really never thought I'd end up. I thought I would have a career as a, a lecturer or an academic at UC Berkeley or one of the neighboring universities. This episode is with Jonathan. Jonathan, I met at a yoga class and he's been living in Zimbabwe for a very long time. He's from the States and he's witnessed a lot of crisis that the country has had, a lot of personal crisis through his job, of course. And we are also talking about how the country and its people are dealing with these often exceptional situations. So thank you, Jonathan, and enjoy this episode of Zim Love. But what happened is my current wife was a possible roommate where we lived in Boston, and she was our second choice. And the first choice was a concert pianist from Lausanne, Switzerland. And uh, she couldn't get her grand piano through the door or the window. So we went on the list and my wife, who was wearing this kind of very old fashioned polyester dress, which people wore then in <laughs> 1979, um, had, you know, wandered in for the interview and we had no one else on the list. So we called her and then she came, right? And she was in the room next to me. So that's how it all began. When I... Uh, when I came to visit, my first look was in 1990, and I got stuck in a coup in Zambia. That was my introduction to so-called Africa. Mm. So I flew in on Air Zambia, and um, it had about 40 rows you know, of seats, and rows 1 to 20 were for passengers, and rows 20 to 40 were for appliances. So there were stereos, refrigerators, stoves, all tied into the seats. Mm. Right, nothing stored. I don't know what was stored below. Right, <laughs> so um, we arrive in Lusaka, mm. and we're told that there that the one faction of the army had tried to take over the city, and the other faction had repelled them. But as a result, there was a dawn to dusk curfew, mm. and we were given a choice: we could either be guests of the airport or be put in a hotel. So they had a workers' committee, which was new to me, and the workers' committee met because we had met with the director of the airport and we had demanded from the director a flight to Zimbabwe, that we would cash in our tickets and we would go to Zimbabwe. But he informed us that unless you notify airspace 48 hours in advance, you'll be shot down. So that wasn't good. So then we said, how about buses? And he said, oh, our roads and our buses, I wouldn't trust your safety. What year was that? This was 1990, July. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we said, okay, We'll go cars. So he actually called up the rental car places and he said, well, I have three cars that can hold 15 of you. Would you be interested? Because there are 99 of you. There were 99 of us for Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And then we took a vote and we decided we're all together. So he said, okay, you now have 15 minutes to get on the bus, which will take you to your hotel. Otherwise, you'll be locked down here. So we all rushed onto the bus got to the hotel where there were army people with Uzis and submachine guns patrolling all the floors. And we each got our own room, which was quite nice. And I was thinking, oh my God, my then girlfriend, future wife, wouldn't know where I am and I'm going to be trapped here for an indefinite period of time. And I kept thinking, well, you know, there were no phones. And I was thinking, how am I going to get in touch? How would anyone know I'm even here? And what's going to happen to me? Meanwhile, all the Zimbabweans were having a great time. They, it was free drinks and food, and they would start drinking at 10 in the morning. 
and they wouldn't stop drinking until four in the morning the next day. And they would do things like jump into the pool naked. And when some of the staff came by, male staff, to try to ask them to stop it, they would pull the male staff in and undress them. <laughs> so it was a constant party, which was my first introduction to how Zimbabweans deal with crises, which is they don't worry. They just take it minute by minute. Now, yeah. you said that um, uh, that you thought you would become an academic in mm -hmm. the States. Right. And I was thinking about that this place gives you the opportunity to practice a certain kind of freedom. Mm -hmm. So self-fulfillment in a way that you can try out different things. And mm -hmm. I've seen this with other friends here. Mm -hmm. Zimbabweans or not Zimbabweans. Mm -hmm. They come here and certainly they feel the, the freedom to try something they they didn't think before. Mm -hmm. And although this place is such a difficult economic time, mm -hmm. they they make it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, how how do you feel about that? Right. <clears throat> so the first thing is, you know, for me, my motto in Zimbabwe is you always get to, you always get to go where you need to go, but never by the way you think. Mm -hmm. Right. And I found that that characterizes my whole 26 years here, that I've gotten more or less to where I want to go, but The route I've taken is never the way I would have planned it in a million years. Mm. It can cause people stress to not <clears throat> know yeah. where they are going. Right. And you said in your story that, which is actually a great story to describe some problems, how you had yeah. the party in a situation of stress. Mm -hmm. And um, I talked to some people in between that told me that they think Zimbabwe is quite a broken country. It's a traumatized country mm -hmm. in various levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you see from the outside is maybe the, the economy or mm -hmm. whatever, but mm -hmm. also on uh, on personal level. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you think it's still like that? Yeah, I think it's a traumatized country, but I think, as you said earlier, that everything operates on a very human level. So despite the trauma, people still find a way of making life worthwhile, though they're getting worn down. I mean, I think that's the biggest problem, that it's so it's continuing on for such a long time. First, there was a liberation war. We never demilitarized. So I still think, you know, the army, guns, violence is still the way that the that the, those in power use to oppress people and keep them down. Mm. But on a day-to-day -day level, you know, people can still celebrate. They can still laugh. Even on food, you know, on fuel cues, right? People make conversations all the time. You make new friends. Mm. Um, and that's what I love about this place, mm. you know? So, yeah. uh, so you've just written a piece that mm -hmm. was published in an anthology. Mm -hmm. And um, it's called... The General's Gun. The General's Gun. Right. But it's all about sort of the worship of power. And all about powerlessness. That's what the story is about. Mm. About how people deal with that situation of being powerless and how those in power also feel powerless because they keep wanting more power. Right? And then they're caught in a horrible cycle of nothing, it's it's not enough mm. because they don't feel safe, or they're just greedy and they don't have an idea about wealth. And I think that's another fascinating thing here where you have people from let's say rural backgrounds who through their business dealings or political connections have become wealthy. But because they haven't had examples around them of wealth, let's say, or, or their Western examples are from TV shows, their concept of wealth is a fantasy. 26 rooms, helicopter pads. So that's what they live and that's what they build. Mm. For those of us who grew up in countries where we live with people who had more wealth, We go the other way usually. We're not ostentatious and we're not showing. In fact, we downplay the wealth. We live comfortably, but we downplay the wealth. Mm -hmm. Well, here it's a fantasy, so people upplay it. Yeah. yeah. But talk about powerlessness yeah. and the, the youth. Yeah. Now, I also work with youth. Mm -hmm. And um, right. what I see with the students uh, a lot and what is hard for me to... To, to bring together is there are sometimes chances for the students. It's applying for scholarships. It's about uh, doing programs. It's about mm -hmm. them going somewhere. It's mm -hmm. about getting tickets, about meeting mm -hmm. Germans, different chances. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of passiveness, mm -hmm. I should say. Right. 
I sometimes think, yeah, maybe it's a way of uh, to deal with <clears throat> having no power anymore. Yeah. And not just for their generation, for the last 10, 20 years, having mm -hmm. no power. So mm -hmm. this is what it ends up being. It's just like a self-protection mode. And mm -hmm. then me coming in as a German, mm -hmm. it's a, it takes a lot of time to, to come together on that. And sometimes it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, what, what, if you, you what if you have expectations and they're rarely fulfilled? Then you stop having expectations, right? Yeah. Now... It's interesting because um, we had a family, uh, shown a family we were very close to, you know, for the first 15 years here, and we supported a lot of the kids through the education, right? And in the days when, the 2008, when there was hardly any petrol and you would have to queue, and we had amazing inflation, she would leave in the morning from Hatfield to go to Spessis College in town. She would leave with a certain amount of money, which was the proper amount of money for a round trip. By the afternoon when she left school, It wasn't, it was insufficient and she wouldn't have enough money to get home. So she'd have to either sleep at a friend's house, sometimes sleep in the street, sometimes be allowed to sleep at the school. And so I asked her, I said, well, how do you deal with this? Doesn't it make you angry? And she said, well, I used to be very angry and very disempowered and want to give up. But I decided I would stop having expectations. I would have a goal but not expectations on how I would achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. And so whether I have to sleep in the street, whether I have to sleep you know, outside my home, it's okay, because I have my eye on the goal. So that was, that's another response, right? And sometimes students drop out in the middle of the program because can, the parents cannot afford anymore. That's right. And it, for me, it breaks my heart. But then I see them and they say, ah, it's okay, ma'am. Yeah. I wait, maybe next year. Mm -hmm. Patience, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a great way to, to protect yourself. Well, then they're very realistic. When we have yeah. the money, we go. When we don't, we don't. Rather than, oh, of course you go through four years of education or three years of education on a tertiary level. That's our expectation. Exactly. But for theirs is, we have the money, we go. We don't have the money, we stop. And then I also then question my role in the mm -hmm. lives of the students because, of right. course, after the program ends, no matter what chances appear with the program, a very small percentage would truly benefit. Then I also question my role. How much can I be responsible for awaking certain mm -hmm. hopes mm -hmm. that I cannot guarantee <clears throat> to right. happen because they're out of my power? Right. So you can't give false hope. No, you cannot. But at the same time, you want to, going through the system of learning a foreign language from a other culture, I think it also, part of it is to have a mentality shift. Mm -hmm. It's And your cultural value that you're carrying over now into Zimbabwe. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that does belong to the program. So, yeah. 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 So we were talking about something really interesting, which was what happens when a culture of privilege, like the kind of culture I come from in America or you come from in Germany, it's a culture of deprivation. And how does that all work, right? Because the culture of deprivation says either why bother or take the opportunity now, take advantage of it now, even if you're not qualified, just get in there and do it. Exactly, right? yeah. The culture of privilege says you're entitled to three to four years of your tertiary education, everything will be worked out, there's financial aid for you, and there may even be a job waiting for you. But here in Zimbabwe, you have thousands of graduates who come out of all these, what, I think we have 10 universities now, they can't find jobs. So it sets up a very strange situation where of futility. And I think that's what a lot of people are facing here. You know, I'm supposed to, I've learned, I have a degree, but it doesn't make a difference. So what am I doing with my life? Here, the, when I speak to the colleagues, when I see what the colleagues go through with now inflation starting again, mm -hmm. it, uh, and they, they keep it protected from me in a certain way. So they don't tell me everything they are going through. Mm -hmm. But I know that they're going through things and it is actually causing me heartache. Right. Because I know they, they are 
they are suffering right now and right. they're tired and they right. have to go through a lot of things mm -hmm. now to bring their kids to school or to pay for mm -hmm. for fuel for all these things yes. and i think this is harder and harder for me to yeah. deal with that and you speak with people maybe more closely about mm -hmm. these things mm -hmm. and this powerlessness mm -hmm. and how do i mean first of all do you see it as i see it and and how do you deal with it okay so first i think coming from a culture of privilege this is extremely painful for us to watch that idea that people can be powerless and that they can actually be sinking lower and lower faster and faster even if they have a university degree right so to that i say i, I can only do what i can right i can't solve the problem i can accept that my culture of privilege has given me skills which i can hopefully use in different ways or try to find ways in which people can be innovative to raise money or my job is usually how do i help people deal with suffering right and how do i help them find ways to suffer less when the situation might be extremely painful and how do i help them if they can't if they can't find a way out they have two choices you either change the situation which they can't do or you change your response to the situation so all i can do is help them find a response that works better for them and that's pretty much how it goes i mean my my interest is what happens when we as human beings are pushed to our limit what do we do then so yeah. is you do what you can you realize the culture or the values you've been given and, and what that gives you and use it in the best way possible, which is to help people with their suffering or to enrich their lives in somehow, in some way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we don't be martyrs. In other words, we don't let the suffering of others cause us so much suffering we can't function. Yeah. I think we owe it to people because we've had so many opportunities and privileges to do what we can as long as we can but also that involves having fun and i think this culture is a lot like that right people can laugh in the most dire circumstances is there a special how can i say a special anecdote a special experience that you had here in the the kind of yeah sign of kindness something that you can think about oh lots kindness fun i think you know zimbabwe here people can be either incredibly cruel or incredibly kind right there's not much in between mm -hmm. i just find that so when i first came to zimbabwe in 1990 to take a look my then girlfriend future wife um, <laughs> picked me up in this car with uh real real problems with um, the drive shaft and, and the, the turning it kept clanking right but she just bought this used car and the guy had convinced her it was a great car so off we go to Ngezi National Park and the roads are quite rough and lo and behold the drive shaft suddenly just drops into the earth and of course the car can't move and the the bolts which held the drive shaft had just been sheared off they just broke and uh, so we were literally in the middle of nowhere with a car that engine turned, but there was no drive shaft to move the wheels. So we were stuck and we didn't have the, any equipment or anything we can really innovate that would make it work, at least in our abilities. So hours passed and uh, this old man in an ox cart, you know what an ox cart is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Comes by with his nephew and sees our dilemma and says, okay, he says, I'm going drinking and uh, i'll be gone about three four hours and uh, if you're still here then i'll help you well three four hours passed no one came by and he comes back right? and he's drunk but um holding a torch in his teeth a flashlight in his teeth because it's getting dark he rigs up this amazing thing we had a few wires and things that enabled us to go another 15 kilometers to the warden's office before once again the drive shaft collapsed. But at least there we could make phone calls because we didn't have cell phones in those days. So just that sort of 
looking after people or the yeah. way that when someone dies in your family, lots of people show up to just say hi, you know, or at least in the old days, the ways that people would just show up on a Sunday just to kind of check, check on you, you know, so there's this lovely kind of um, feeling that, that people in some way do look after each other rather than in a country that's more governed by the industrial revolution where you're just a cog in a machine. Yeah. Right. And your only value is when you break. That's the only time they really care about you because now they have to replace you and it's a pain or fix you. Mm. But here there's a more human, there's a more human web. Mm. And that's what I think is very special about this place. I don't think it could happen in New York City or Berlin. No, no. that's in life. Yeah. Yeah. That just happens here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much. Pleasure. For coming to my house, being my guest. Pleasure. It's great. Thanks for all the interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for this wonderful interview. Thank you for all the stories you shared with us. And I hope that you got some new insights from his and also this time my perspective of living in Zimbabwe. And I hope you enjoyed this episode of Zim Love.